Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Somewhere between science and superstition. We have such sights to show you. Strange eons. Welcome to Strange Eons Radio. That's Eric Morgrid over there. Yes, it is. That's Vanessa Williams over there. It is also me. I am Kelly Young. Hey, guys. A little peek behind the curtain. We record these um, two at a time, and Shh. I'm only... I can't believe it's you're revealing your secret. secrets. <laughs> I'm only mentioning this because this uh, coronavirus situation is changing so quickly yeah. that by the time you hear this, I don't know exactly where we will all be. Yeah. So we are in a room together right now, but we are not defying any kind of crazy laws just yet. In two weeks' time... Um, we very well may be being told to stay in your home. Do yeah. not talk to other people. Yeah. <laughs> so with all of that in mind, though, what's, uh, what's everybody been up to since the last time I spoke to you? <laughs> oh, it's been so long, Kelly. It's been so long. Well, I just wanted to take a quick second and actually say that Danny. Yeah. Oh, my God. There, uh, I've been gifted this really cool like Star Trek object, which I have been envying. One other friend I know has it. It's got a bunch of blueprints of uh, Next Generation NC. Uh, oh my gosh, it, it's the 1701D, and it's like all the blueprints. It's so cool. Thank you so much. That was an incredibly cool gift. Danny is a really, uh, just a, a wonderful human being. Um, I've, I've yeah. ended up becoming an actual friend with him. We yeah. discuss uh, a lot of stuff online, and he's um, just a real sweetheart. It makes me happy to know that there are people like that out in the world. Completely. True. Yeah, like that was, you know, that was just out of the blue and just such a thoughtful kind, generous gift that's just perfect. It's just so nice. He's one of those guys that, uh, you know, he's a super fan. He's been listening to the show since day one and all that. And then uh, he he hears how much of a trek <laughs> fan you are. He's, he's like, you know, I've got something I've got a that, solution I, for this. that I don't, you know, uh, that I'm not using or something. Because yeah. he's done that with me a couple of times and the things uh. that I collect and everything. He's just like, oh, you like this? I have this and I don't know why I have it, but oh, it's yours man. now. Well, Danny, I is so appreciated. I may even like frame one of these. I might find my favorite one of them and get it get it immortalized ah, cool. well, if yeah. you do that take a photo of it and we'll i post absolutely it will yeah. yeah once this passes by and i can go back into a michael's without fearing my life right <laughs> <laughs> danny was also the guy that helped uh eric and i get our film shown yeah. at the drive-in there in north oh, carolina yeah. cool. so he's he's that guy he's just oh, been making the connection ooh, good yeah, time he, to be running a drive-in yeah well, he actually, actually posted i shared it on the strange Eons uh -huh. page that that uh that North Carolina drive-in was open and showing oh, movies. Oh, that's and so cool. They are, uh, they're spreading out the cars a little further and stuff like that. I'm like, you know, this is so neat. I hope that I hope that this is the kind of stuff that can continue on while we're in the midst of all this. Yeah. I agree. In fact, um, when talking about the things that we've watched recently, I was going to say it's with a heavy heart, but I'm also glad I managed to sneak it in. I, I fit in two movie-going experiences before we closed down all the movie theaters, and it is hard. Hard. It is hard not being able to go to the movies. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It is. That's weird. It yeah. is. It's a huge like my I, my only social activities are, <laughs> I guess, social, going to movie <laughs> theaters and not talking to anybody, um, <laughs> hanging out with you guys, and then I have like a cult movie night and a trivia night at that s one of the cinemas that I went and visited. It's like we were talking about with a friend of ours mm -hmm. doing a. I don't know what you'd call it, a virtual drink get together or right. something. Right. Yeah. You could probably do that with cold nights, you know, I'll get in front of your computer and could, could. talk. And well, we haven't brought yeah. up any of the, that kind of stuff, but did you see that uh, Netflix has made it available so that you can do like a viewing party? Yes. Yeah. It's remotely. like a, is it a Chrome app or something? I heard, I just heard about this and it sounds like such a great solution. It's, it's, you know, one of the ways that with all this social distancing that yeah. we are being, you know, forced to do, it's one of the ways to keep, in contact with your friends, especially it's if so you do smart. like movie nights or something, yeah. like, you know, so I, we'll all be doing that alone together, I guess. Yeah. This yeah. is the new normal for a while. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. I still have, I can still hang out with my mom. She's the one person I'm spending time with, trying not to get her infected with Good. my germs. Good. So. Six we, feet apart with her. 
<laughs> I've been wiping Plastic down everything. Sheet. I know. <laughs> I I just have to accept that I've got to be really clean. Like I um de I I went into the house last week wearing gloves and everything I put down. You know, like I you know I had the gloves on and then I went around the house. I took off the gloves. I washed myself, my hands, all my clothes, and then it's like okay, I feel all right. This seventy something year old woman won't die from me today. Yeah, nice. it, it's kind of crazy to see. I mean, this is how fast these things happen. But it's kind of kind of wild to think that four weeks ago <laughs> we were living life as we always have. I can't have, even and now think we're about doing it. This zoom. I, yeah, it's like I don't even know how we're like as a as a species. I don't know how we're supposed to exist much longer in this state. I'm like, we have no economy. Are we going to go into trade, trade, ing goods? Well, what do I, we do? We have no money. We have no nothing. We have no goods. Well, we have some goods. <laughs> yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how <laughs> uh, how we pull out of this. I mean, once we do pull out of this, the economy is going to go fucking insane. I know. Yeah, Everyone's going to buy everything. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. good. Yeah. But I have a feeling that this will, I mean, small businesses, uh, I don't know how they're going to manage. I've been curious, too. I wonder if there's, I think, is it agoraphobia, fear of going outside, or fear of big spaces? Mm -hmm. All right. Agoraphobia? Is it going to I wonder if that's going to skyrocket. I I wonder, especially when they (laughs) first open, let us, like, back out. I wonder if all of a sudden we're going to be terrified of going to our local. Like, I went to a cafe um, yesterday, and there was, like, the distancing and the doors propped open, and you can still order drinks and take them out. But I did have that moment when I went in, like, huh, I'm terrified of touching anything. Yeah. I'm yeah. terrified of who's in here. Like the barista, I'm terrified for the baristas right. that they're <laughs> dealing with me. It's yeah, it's weird. It's just yeah, weird. I don't know. I, I mean, once this all blows over, I don't think terrified is the right word, but I think right. that we will be all a lot more aware. Yes. I, I have a feeling that handshakes may become a thing of the past. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we all show up here and, and give a big hug to each other, except for this time. This time. Like nobody's touching anything. It's like the anything. first time. <laughs> Finger <laughs> pistols. That's right. Hey, <laughs> yeah. I know. It just doesn't feel as good. Oh, well. Hey, I uh, I started watching the new season of Westworld. Anybody else? I did not yet. I started watching. I realized I hadn't seen the last one, so I started oh. watching last seasons. Ooh, got boy. one episode in and got bored and stopped. Last season was rough. Yeah. It was boring. I was like, what? Episode seven, though, is worth oh the entire God, season. Yes. Okay, all right. And it, it, if you really me. hate it, it's independent, too. Yeah, you, you could really watch to... seven, and it doesn't Maybe matter do what happened because before. I really am not enjoying it. <laughs> Episode seven should have been what the season two was. Oh man, that would have been great. And this feels like a soft reboot of what the show is about. Oh really? It's, it's oh really? Set out in in the world, the world. now. It's not in okay. Westworld or. I heard uh, for the Seahawks fans out there, Marshawn Lynch is yeah. in this episode. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> that kind of cool. That was an interesting little thing. <laughs> huh. Um. It, it has absolutely nothing of what I loved about Westworld in it, and okay. it's really well done, very well acted, and all of that stuff, and it's got kind of a, uh, I don't want to say Blade Runner feel, because it doesn't feel as dystopian as this, mm. but there are a couple of nods that felt Blade Runner inspired. Mm. felt more like, uh, you know how much I love that movie, uh, Upgrade. Felt oh, like yeah. it was existing uh, in that world. That's a cool Ooh, world. That's, that's nice. Yeah, and so I, I watched it and I was like, yeah, eh, boy, I, I just wish it wasn't called Westworld, I guess. Yeah. So the first I'm season was good it. for Westworld, and then from then on, it could be yeah this different world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brave now it's just new world. the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although I'm sure that there are people out there going, hmm, I think they're still in some kind of uh, ah. fake world or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I can't tell what the twist is as far as, you know, the twist in the first season was that about halfway through you realize what you were watching was happening in completely right. different timelines. Mm-hmm. And then they, yeah. they went a little further with that in the second season. And I'm like, yeah. I, I don't even want to try and wrap my head around if they're doing that. Because if they are, I don't get it at all. Yeah. in this season yeah. so interesting I'll and keep watching but only because uh, there's not anything else that's really sci-fi yeah. that I love on it like yeah. I dropped Picard hard I fucking hate it <laughs> I don't hate it at all it's just I actually you know I, I got like three episodes in and I've just been downloading them and accruing them for yeah, some kind of I'm doing interior too. Picard party. Like, I mean, <laughs> Patrick, Patrick Stewart can pretty much do I no know, wrong for I me. I feel the same, but I'm so bored. Oh, really? well, you're not, I think 
the two of us are far bigger Star Trek fans oh, to begin absolutely. with. Than you yeah, are. like so there's a lot I, of goods in there. The second episode made me go, oh, shit. But I thought the third episode, it's set up with the crew and things going on. It's yeah. like, okay, I think there's I'm going gonna, gonna to like where this is going. I just but. liked the little nods that I started seeing, like um, Hugo or Hugh, Hugh the Borg yeah. being back in it. And it's the same actor. That was really neat. There's probably a lot in there for big fans. Yeah. And that, is, that is not me. Yeah. yeah. That's totally, totally understandable. And, and again, go back to what we said, I think, two episodes ago. That first episode was so it was. good. It, it was, was really good. But it's like, oh, come on, guys. Yeah. Watchmen managed to pull off a whole season of being yeah. so good. The yeah. boys did it, too. Come on, Star Trek it's can do it. It's tough, too, because I don't know. Like, I assume not many of the same people behind Discovery are behind Picard. But, like, Discovery was so rough because the first, like, three episodes were so different than the entire rest of the series. Yeah. It like changed gears hard. And then the second season they were like, no, we've really got to change gears hard. Like this isn't even the same show. Yeah. We got a new captain, two new captains mm-hmm. from the free previous. We got, I, uh, I, Love the hell out of the second season. Oh, me too. Oh, because yeah. they figured out <laughs> so like, good. oh, uh, what's his name? Pike is so Pike. watchable. Yeah. So watchable. Great so casting. much more fun. Oh, he was great. He was wonderful. I got to yeah. keep watching that. That was one that you kind of mm-hmm. told me I didn't have to watch the first season if I really didn't want to. And yeah. I watched like three episodes of the second season and I liked it. And then just That's so good by the end. other stuff. It there's ramps up to stuff. getting better, too. Yeah, it's, it gets a little there's I get a little tired of like the sideways cam with like light leaks and like oh, sure. everything's crazy. The uh, crazy influence alerts. of um, JJ. JJ's, JJ's movies, yeah. which I, I love those movies. But in like a two hour chunk is a hell of a lot different than like, you know, a 10, 10 episodes. 10 episodes. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Well, I took advantage of the theaters being closed and the streaming pay for streaming at home and sure. watched uh, The Invisible Man last night. Oh, shit. That is so damn good. good. Oh, right, though, was God, it, I mean, it's good. It, it was yeah. just hitting all of my uh, home invasion buttons, you know, and so I was like <laughs> uncomfortable through most of this. I, I could see that. I could see that. But um, yeah, I thought it was incredibly the well done. Gaslighting is so... Mm-hmm. Oh. It's sick. I mean, yeah. it's sick. It's sick and it's amazing. And Elizabeth Moss freaking kills it. Yeah, she's great. Plus, I, was a, I don't know if either of you watched the show Leverage. No. Which is a really neat show about uh, con men that get hired to screw over people that screwed over other people. So it's a lot of fun. And the guy she was living with as her, her friend was one of the key guys in that. So okay. I was like, oh, oh. Really cool. It's cool to see him doing he something else. He was super good. Like in the girl who played his daughter, mm-hmm. I loved her. A lot of the acting was strong. Yeah, it's really good. I wasn't quite as bothered by the the Invisible Man the, as you the were, dude bro. Because I'm watching when he shows up, I'm going, okay. I I I, it, I, just, I felt like he was pretending. He was himself trying to pretend to be something he wasn't. Sure. So he was multi level acting. Yeah. And watching it that way, I kind of liked it because sure. then I'm watching him slip up. I just wanted like slipped just Matt for a second or, two. or something. I wanted like I wanted somebody that I could sort of be like, I understand how you can convince the world you're super cool, mm. but we can also see that you're super sleaze. I don't yeah. know. There's just something missing for me, but I that's I'm yeah. super glad that you actually didn't have a problem with that because that it didn't ruin the film, but it was it was a little bit tough. It was a tough part of the film to have a problem with one of the actors. Yes, <laughs> with that particular one, yeah. especially. I'd like to see Universal now take this route with their films. If yes. They have to, if they have to remake the classic horror, then give it to a young, like star, like starving indie, like ready to just push got an the idea. boundaries. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. was this was directed by Lee Wan L, who did mm-hmm. Upgrade. So, right. I mean, uh, you know, that's the kind of person they need to hand this to and not say, would you like to do the Invisible Man? Say, do you have a good idea right. for this? Right. And if they don't, then, you know, go, all right, well, we'll, we'll find somebody. Yeah. Find somebody young and hot with talent and go, which of these Universal Monsters appeals to you? Which one of these can you make a new and interesting story about? And we're not the idea of taking any of those Universal films and turning them into a giant Tom Cruise vehicle is weird. Yeah, because it, it just doesn't fit. No, any of them. I've always wanted to take uh, the Dracula story and put it in outer space. 
Oh, Whoa. And, life, mean, life force gone out. <laughs> well, <laughs> so like, come back here. I mean, the, you know, a big <laughs> chunk of the book takes place on the boat that is bringing yeah. Dracula to to England and I'm like if that's a spaceship and you've got nowhere you can go and you're stuck on there with a vampire that seems like a cool story to me it is it's very it's got that like almost alien vibe of like there's something in here and it's fucking us up yeah that'd be cool if the the rest of Hollywood should go down sit in a room with Blumhouse or Jason Blum and go how do you spend money on your films because this was one of like his "Quote unquote big budget," I yeah. think. So it's like what five million or something, five or ten million or something. No, I think it was twenty-two million. Was it twenty-two? Yeah. He spends all the money right. Cause yeah, it's all on the screen. That uh, movie would have been a hundred and fifty million from Universal or uh, Paramount or something. I applaud him, and I hope he continues to bring back that twenty to thirty million dollar budgets because Hollywood desperately needs that middle ground between the usual Blumhouse of what two million and the usual Hollywood film of two hundred million. Right. We need that middle You're ground. You're definitely missing back. it. Universal would have spent a ton of money on effects, and mm-hmm. he—I don't know if it was him or his director of photography—who realized, oh, look, if I get the right angle of a chair mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. and we just linger on it people are going to get uneasy yep mm-hmm. those shots of the empty door and yeah. stuff oh my she, god oh, she, Jesus, like, totally and because you know ooh. like you know that feeling of feeling like there's something off and if you just play with that that's mm-hmm. what's interesting not like the weird thing that you can construct with cgi yeah or even the tiniest little things that you might not even see like i know I looked away at this at some point during the screen mm-hmm. and I didn't feel like rewinding to catch it because the movie is just moving so well. And Dean was like, ah! I'm like, fuck, I miss. <laughs> and a little earlier, something like that happened to the opposite where when he pulls the knife off the counter, yeah. she missed that. <gasps> so I love that there's those yeah. subtle things that you might actually miss. Yeah. Didn't go from a, here's our wide angle, zoom into the knife flipping <laughs> off the table. Right. No. It's like, yeah, so I, that smart. was that was such a joy. Yeah, those little details and thinking at times, wait, is he there th- right now or isn't he there right, right now? Right. You know, like you couldn't like when she opens the door and then it's like, it, did he follow her back in or is he outside now? Those moments are the th- things that I'm interested in yes. as a movie goer. And the concept, I won't tell you what it was, but the concept of how he became invisible was really so smart. plausible. So Believable. smart. <laughs> and, and it was... Um, it wasn't telegraphed to you. Mm-hmm. It was shown in a little brief thing at the yep. beginning and then a line of dialogue in yeah. the middle. And you're you're just left to figure it out. And yep. most of us are smart enough that that's all we need. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, we didn't have to linger on that entire. St- I mean, like, yeah, they, they made this for movie goers who pay enough attention. Yeah. They did not force feed any of it. Really. This is a put your phone down yep. kind of film. Yeah. Yeah, and Lee has even kind of hinted at that this might take place in the same world as Upgrade, which I liked. Okay, ah, nice. here's a question, though. Is the house that um, is the, her house from the beginning, is that the same house as the Upgrade house? No. No. Mm-mm. He just has a giant cement home fetish. <laughs> that might be. It was like such That's a true. like brutalist, modern big glass and cement house. Yeah. I was like, man, this is, it feels like the same world as Upgrade because it's the same damn architecture. Well, remember the house in Upgrade, <laughs> though, uh, sat like underground. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, from like the inside. Uh, yeah, like did, the I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. similarities, but it was sort of the outside of the house was the complete opposite, De- but the inside was fairly yeah. similar. I do remember watching on, what a weird place to have your bedroom. I know. <laughs> it's right, right next to the dining room. It's like, okay. <laughs> Hey, if that's where the view of the ocean is. Oh, right. yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Vanessa, did you get um, to see anything? Yeah. So uh, before the movie theaters closed, I actually managed to catch at Central Cinema, they were playing Mouth of Madness. Oh, cool. Oh. So I added it to my Carpenter, actually got to see in a big on a big screen. Oh, you hadn't seen it on the big screen? I hadn't. Oh. I'd only seen it in small. So I've now seen just um, not that many. The Fog, Escape from New York, and Mouth of Madness are the only ones now I've caught in cinema. The mm-hmm. Thing yeah. is spectacular. Yeah. I really want to see it on, on they, a big screen. They did that one year down at Lovecraft, and it was... Right, I hadn't watched the thing in a long time at that point, so I'm mm. going, God, I hope this holds up. Holy shit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what a reintroduction to that film. It's like, 
<laughs> oh my God. Yeah, exactly. Cause like I've only seen it on a smaller screen mm. and like it's, I just think it would be so cool to see those giant landscapes of being right, in exactly. the snow and the ice with that. Yeah. So, so how did you yeah. feel about Mouth, Mouth of Madness? You know, I actually, it's funny cause it felt like almost watching a different movie to a certain extent. The creature effects to me were of the level of the thing. And I don't think I'd realized how good they were until mm -hmm. seeing them as big as I did. And I was like, Oh my God, not all of them some are a little weird and a little cheapish yeah. but a lot of them i was like you guys freaking brought it like this is this is really creepy and the setting and the space and the mix of wide space and claustrophobia mm -hmm. worked really well mm -hmm. um and just seeing sam neill just act his little heart out oh, yeah. Yeah. super fun it's interesting you say that because i kind of the thing with the creatures was the part that always bugged me mm -hmm. until i rewatched it a couple years ago or something yeah. i'm going I don't know why this bugged me so much. This it's works just decent. as fine in the as the whole film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It still bugs me a little bit, but only because they, it would have been so much more impactful if we hadn't seen the monster at all. I think if sure. we had just seen the look sure. on her face, yeah. right. I think that would have been a stronger moment. And that would have fit the overall film The feel of better the Lovecraft as well. influences mm -hmm. would have been stronger. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I felt like I felt like just the worlds were sort of combining in a weird way that you got in color into space where I don't know that it felt like it was the actual, I guess the creatures when they come through the portal, yeah. that's when we're, but that's before that, like the weird fleshy yeah, walls and stuff, oh, that stuff's and great. the, yeah, things vibrating and her like upside down and backwards walking around chasing after him. Like <laughs> that was the stuff that I was like, Oh my God. I agree. I yes. agree. Yeah, that that's so, one of my favorite films. Period. I love that movie, man. Yeah, it was it was really. I was super happy to be able to, to support our local cinema and do that. And I was really bummed. I'm I'm really bummed now because I was like, "Are you guys going to stay open through this thing?" And they're like, "Oh, we have to, we have to stay." <laughs> which which theater was it? Central. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I was like, "Oh shit!" But yeah. I'm sure they'll be okay. I'm sure Hopefully, they'll, they'll ramp up their kitchen and do. Take out orders, do something. They're close, yeah. They close their kitchen. Oh, they, they close do. everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's too bad. It's all, it's all done. I think they might try to do a trivia, like a remote trivia thing. Yeah, sure. So. It, this is kind of forcing us all to figure out different ways to do the things it we is. love. Yeah. I, yeah, like um, my equivalent of going to like a video store has been for several years now just going to the library oh, and going sure. through their DVD selection and picking weird stuff I haven't even thought to watch. Yeah. So now I don't have that. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, both Canopy and Hoopla uh -huh. are, especially Hoopla's King County Library Systems oh, app yeah. that you could rent – Canopy, you can get five movies a month, and that's based on your library card. Hoopla, you can get movies, music, and ebooks. Oh, I got to get in on there. this, I, and yeah. I think I asked you before. I don't have to go into the library I don't to get my. To I don't get a think library you do. Card, right? I don't think okay. so. So, uh, but those are both worth. Hoopla is kind of a frustrating yeah. app, but it's worth. You know, it's Where free. For the <laughs> you know, selection. Canopy is phenomenal, but yeah. they only have five movies a month. But. Uh, I'm really hoping that this is a good time for people to start release those those films that probably would have been hidden almost on like Netflix or on Hulu, those original mm. content. I'm really hoping we're going to see a nice little flush of those getting released to us and being able to engage in them in a larger th way than we would have. Yeah, like before it would have been like a test of like how many people are going to bother watching this? And now it's like, oh, no, we can make it an event. We're going to have to put together something for the listeners of, uh, yeah. of films that are available that we think, you know, hey, yeah. if you haven't seen this and you have a streaming service and you're quarantined, yeah. then maybe now is the best time to check this out. Here's our Amazon Prime list. Here's our Netflix list. Right. Here's, Here's our, our Shutter list. list. Shutter. Shutter. Here's our Shutter list. You guys just will have to do the watch Disney Shutter. Shutter. <laughs> or, or just at least watch all the Joe Bob Briggs there Darn right. Oh, my God. If you guys haven't seen the Joe Bob Briggs specials, you that is that alone is such a fun well, anything else before we jump into our break? I don't think so. Okay. We will be right back when we are talking uh, anthology segments. This is how Lego grows. Like a song, Lego building bricks start out simple. First, it's new Lego preschool for little hands. Then Lego building sets and models for older children. With more Lego wheels to snap on, moving shutters and doors, Lego grows from child to child. Hour after hour, day after day, year after year, Lego changes. Start with one little piece and see how it grows. 
There's no end to Lego. And we are back. All right, guys, so um, one of my favorite things is anthology films, but as we all know, it's a mixed bag. You, you, you get the good and the bad with that, and so it's hard to True. take a anthology film and promote that as a great film. Yeah, it's, it's usually just one segment. Yep. <laughs> I don't know, did you guys see Nightmare Cinema, the anthology that just came out? Mick, no, Mick because I heard only some of it was good. Only one of it is good, Ooh. but that one is fucking great. Uh, so it's it's worth the rental. I think you talked about that here one time. I think I did, and I think it's on ago. Shutter. So oh, it's yeah. worth watching okay, the cool. first segment. Which oh, the is, first one. It's Got spectacular. It. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I remember you talking about that because we were talking about why do you. Start with the best instead of end with the best. Well, it makes sense because if they had started with any of the other ones, I would have just not watched any. Wow. Wow. Um, With that in mind, I decided that uh, it'd be more fun for us to pick a segment from our favorite anthology film. Or or just, you know, just promote something maybe people aren't aware of. And so I chose from 1983 the anthology film Nightmares. Somewhere between the real and the unreal. It's according to the legend, das Teufel Nagetier cannot be destroyed. Between the world of daylight and the dark of night. the bishop of battle, master of all I survey. Between the peaceful sleep of dreams and the endless sleep of death lies the realm of nightmares. that you've never heard of and that you will never forget. Nightmares is this year's sleeper. And the segment I chose is called Benediction. So a little bit of background on this film. It had a budget of $6 million. And if IMDb is to be believed, a (laughs) box office of $7,000. Oh, that's like... Five people showed up. I don't up. know how this Two. would be possible. Something must have happened. <laughs> one Has screen in no New York, one screen in L.A. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, you know what? One this, is, this is a weird film. You can't uh, stream this. And if you, I, I own this film, but if you go onto um, Amazon or something, it's only third-party sellers, and they're Whoa. $80, $90. Oh, okay. Whoa. For, uh, VHS or a DVD. And the DVD is a looks like a scan of the VHS. <laughs> oh, my God. The one I have looks like a scan of the VHS. Oh, it's it's pretty rough. Come on, Shout Factory or exactly. Vinegar Syndrome. Somebody, <laughs> right, somebody right. get on this. It was written by a guy named Christopher Crowe, who has done just a ton of 90s television sitcoms and the movie Last of the Mohicans. Weird. <laughs> yeah, because Last of the Mohicans is actually a pretty solid film, a yeah, very serious solid. film. Yes. And the rest of his uh, IMDb is all 90s sitcoms. You know, not 80 sitcoms, not good stuff. No, nope, 90s. Sitcoms. He must have had it burning inside him. Right. He was waiting. He was like, this is my time. <laughs> Last of Mohicans. Oh, there you go. I will find you. <laughs> Love that line. <laughs> uh, directed by Strange Eons Radio regular Joseph Sargent, Ooh. who Yay. I have talked about on uh, when I talked about Colossus, the Forbin Project. I believe that was our AI episode with John O'Bannon. Yes. Uh, the Night That Panicked America, which was the Halloween episode, one of the Halloween yeah, episodes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then also he did Jaws the Revenge. He's also done <laughs> just a ton of really great movies. Jaws the Revenge really killed his career. Oh. That's too bad. <laughs> That's yeah. too bad. So um, the anthology has four episodes in it. And uh, 
One of them is a very, very common um, urban legend, the one about the girl who's driving and the uh, the killer is in the backseat. Oh, so it's got, yeah. So it's got that. It's also got uh, Emilio Estevez in it as a video game junkie who gets uh, drawn into a video game. So and, weird. And uh, Veronica Cartwright, who most of us know best from... Invasion of the Body Snatchers, an alien, and she is battling a gigantic rat in her home. And there is no, um, there is no, you, you know, wraparound story that oh, ties really? these together oh. in any way. It's huh. just a weird thing where it's like, here's this, here's a title, go. Wow. Interesting. The uh, the segment that I love is called Benediction, and it stars our favorite Lance Henriksen. Yay! As a uh, as a priest who has lost his faith, he's out there in the middle of fucking nowhere in this uh, very tiny church, and one of his parishioners got sick, and it just devastated Lance. He he felt like you know what kind of God could do this to a person? A loving God would not allow this to happen, basically. And the other priests are trying to tell him. You know, this is how this is how the world works. Uh, the Lord works in mysterious ways, and all this stuff. And and he's you know just tired of the platitudes, and he's he's gone. So he packs up his uh, Chevy Malibu and he takes off. And that's when this becomes kind of a ripoff of the Steven Spielberg TV movie Duel. An homage. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Let's call it that, because pretty quickly he starts being harassed by a gigantic black. 1979 Chevy C20 pickup truck. And uh, this truck is is oddly not scary at all. It's just a big pickup truck. It's got the big knobby wheels and everything and tinted windows. But it's such a common looking truck. It's got like a <laughs> light bar on top of it. And uh, it does not sure. seem like, um, like the kind of truck that uh, we find out. The devil would drive, unless the what? devil is just a good old boy. <laughs> we never mean it no harm. Yeah, we do find I'm always out. trouble with the law. <laughs> <laughs> we do find out that it is the devil because at one point we get a POV shot from inside the cab. We don't get to see the driver, but swinging from the rear view mirror is an upside down cross. Nice. So, and that makes sense. I, you know. The devil's not going to have like a, a Christmas tree air freshener, right? <laughs> Unless it's Dice. evil. I don't know. You smell some of those. <laughs> this must be what evil smells like. Mm. The, the truck uh, runs Lance off the road a couple of times. At one point, you know, it's like bumping bumpers with him, following mm. him. And Lance is freaking out. Why are you doing this to me? And then, and then he goes off the road and the truck just barrels on by. The, the part where you really realize that this is a supernatural truck, and this is where you'll know if you've seen this movie or not, Eric, okay. is that um, he thinks that he has escaped it, and he's kind of just sitting in his, his uh, Chevy Malibu, and he's breathing hard, and he's just like, oh my God, but the truck is nowhere to be seen. And then it explodes from underneath the ground. What? <laughs> the oh, truck oh, what? explodes out of the ground and does oh this my God. Like, <laughs> lands, you know, <laughs> And uh, and then it just T bones him, destroys his car. Whoa! Um, if you're a car guy nice. like me, this is the scene where you go, uh, that Malibu that he's been driving and the Malibu that just got crashed into, <laughs> those are different cars from <laughs> different years. The taillights are different uh, styles. And are they painted the same color? It's painted the it's same fine. color, and it is, it's fine. it is a Malibu, but it's like a three year difference because all of a sudden the very uh, iconic round taillights become these square taillights from a car that was probably a lot cheaper uh, to destroy. Than. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> well, anyway, then the truck uh, disappears. The ambulance shows up. They're helping out Lance. He's trying to explain to them that the devil has been harassing him. And, and they're like, well, there's there's no other vehicle involved in this uh, you know, if you're an ambulance guy, don't you look at this demolished car that's burning <laughs> like, and go, wait, well, what did happen? Yeah. But, I didn't um, run into a cactus, buddy. <laughs> right. I've heard of but they, they do say to him, well, uh, we can take you to the nearest town here. Um, you know, that seems to be where you were heading. And he says, no, take me back to my church. That's where I belong. Oh, mm -hmm. beautiful. The, the lesson has been learned. Oh. Uh, the movie, like I said, really hard to find. Lance is 
fucking great in it. He is nice. so earnest. He's like acting his ass off. And Ugh. it's the only thing that saves this kind of silly movie is this segment. Because Emilio <laughs> is really bad in his segment. Although Aww. I did love that at one point he's listening to... Uh, Let's have a war, <laughs> which is also in the Repo Man movie that he was in. And I, I was like, did they do that on purpose? I don't know. Um, and the Veronica Cartwright one, the giant rat, is uh, when you see the giant rat, it's pretty disappointing. Is it like mm. Mickey Mouse it's, on a bender? No, no. It's a, just a gigantic rubber bag yeah. puppet. <laughs> so the movie, not great. This segment, really great. Oh, Very cool. Yeah. I love that. I love Lance Henriksen. He, Who uh, doesn't? And this is a young Lance Henriksen. Oh. He only looks like he's about 70. In nice. <laughs> I mean, he was like, probably 30, but he only <laughs> looks like he was 70. <laughs> oh, man. He um, he met Pizza and uh, took her out on the, his smoke break and started chewing on her crust and getting pictures. Oh, my. Yeah. Is this a Cope to Con? Yeah, it was. was there? Yeah. It was pretty wonderful. He's a very personable guy. He's a lot he of fun. Was, we were talking about our sexual him. exploits, but uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a little thing about me and Doug Bradley later. <laughs> I look forward to learning more. I was there for that one. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Next. Maybe, maybe. Maybe I don't want to know. Shall I dive in now? Yeah, okay. please. This one worked out great for me. Because I'm going through, oh, man, maybe I'll do uh, Carpenter's Body Bags. And I rewatched oh that. Oh, my God. Went, That's a are, rough one. These are all okay. okay. Yeah. None of them are really bad, but none of them are really good. Yeah. Although it is fun to see John Carpenter be. Like a horror <laughs> host. Thing. Yeah. He's, I thought and he was also, horrible uh, at it. What's his name with his long flowing locks of hair? Oh, I blinked he, already. <laughs> it must have been. Gwen Callahan is going to text me. And, two weeks and say <laughs> it's <dumb> this name. Ass. <laughs> oh, I know who you're talking about. Because uh, it's the segment Irons, with Michael um, Don't know. Michael, Michael Irons? Or no, my, no. Uh, Stacey Keach. Stacey, yes. Yes. Because uh, he's got the, the worm hair. Yeah. That's, oh, a, that's yeah. a look. His hair never looks good in that whole no, thing. No, that wig is awful, <laughs> but man, he's in love with it. Yes, he's, he's fun. He's always fun yeah. to watch. But no, this brought me to one I actually had never seen before. And uh, called uh, from 1945, called Dead of Night. Never been here before. Like some tea, wouldn't you? Do you take milk and sugar? Milk and sugar, Mr. Craig. Milk and sugar, Mr. Craig. Still there. So it isn't a dream this time. I beg your pardon. Yes, it isn't a dream this time. I must be going out of my mind. You see, everybody in this room is part of my dream. Everybody. Good Lord, really? Very extraordinary. You're kidding. Not all of us. I can only tell you that when I came into this room, I recognized you all, instantly. Having seen all our photographs in the newspapers, I take it up to their stopping. <laughs> of course, you may have seen me on the sports page. Motor racing's my life. That's my chance. I can't make it. Just room for one inside, sir. sort of teamed up with him, aren't you? Him? My good man think nothing of it. I'm just about through with that cheap hand anyway. Oh, oh, oh. Tip back, tip back. You'll be sorry for this later, you know? Yes, I suppose I will. Jump, 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 jump! <laughs> Let's play another game. Yes, hide and seek. Who's to hide? I'll hide, I'll hide. Yes, Mr. Craig, hide, Mr. Craig, hide, Mr. Craig, hide. Just room for one more. 
you're in charge of. <laughs> Whoa. God damn it, I love this. And how were you able to find this? Because I wanted to do a segment from this. Canopy. Yeah. It's on Canopy. It's the only place I could find it. Oh, that sounds crazy. I didn't know that there were anthology films. I mean, I guess Twilight. It's one of the earliest. I think they reference, some of the stuff I was reading about, they reference one other film that came beforehand, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a horror, and it, it it was structured differently. It was more like what you were just talking about, where it's like here's a bunch of short right. stories, mm. where this has a wraparound and what we think of now as most anthology films. Uh, this was <laughs> this goes back into our Rotten Tomatoes high level ratings, where it was ninety seven from critics and eighty six from the crowd. This movie is so good, oh, yeah, man. It floored me. This is one that's kind of hard to put a segment to, because it is one of the rare ones where they. They all work. They're all good, but there are two that stand above. And I went with one that just stuck with me for a little bit longer for some reason, which was the segment called The Haunted Mirror. The ventriloquist one the ventriloquist was the one other. Is the one I yes. love. And, the, and honestly, too, the wraparound story for this, the way it ties everything together is fantastic. Wow, that's a rare rarity. Every, th- every segment ties into the wraparound story directly. Whoa. And the movie wraps up because of the way the segments come together. So it works. Uh, The Haunted Mirror, though, was directed by Robert Hammer. Hammer? Hammer? Uh, The Spider and the Fly and To Paris with Love or some other stuff. Oh, sure. So some good stuff. Written by John Baines, who wrote, also wrote the Ventriloquist segment and uh, Simba and The Blue Lagoon. Mm. Not that one. Oh, this one was from 1949. I was going to say, geez, he must have been 90 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was a rough ride, but he got it. Uh, starring, uh, I don't know how to say this one, Guji or Googie Withers, hmm. G-O-O-G-I-E. But I appeared in Shine, that one, oh. <laughs> and uh, Haunted Honeymoon. Also has uh, Esmond Percy, who is in the Telltale Heart, and uh, Murder with an exclamation point. <laughs> it's, it's the musical. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Ralph Michael, uh, Night to Remember, Empire of the Sun, Lionheart, Doctor Who. This is a British film. These are all fairly solid British actors, good directors. Um, so the storyline is a woman gives her new husband, a, or soon-to-be husband, a mirror, and uh, while using the mirror, this one is very Twilight zone a little more so than most of them. He, whenever he looks in the mirror, the bedroom's completely different. It looks like a bedroom from 40, 50 years earlier or something mm. where the big, beautiful four-poster beds and mm. something out of like the uh, any good haunted horror, f- right. <laughs> haunted house horror film from that time period <clears throat> starts to drive him insane. And he can't figure out what's going on. He doesn't know what's go- why he keeps seeing that. And his wife uh, looks into it, finds out what the story is that's going on, which I'm not going to segment because these are short segments, too. Yeah. yeah. You know, so these are 10 minute, 10, 15 minute shorts because I think there's five or six of them in the whole movie with the wraparound story as well. It, the, the ending may not necessarily be hard to predict, but you may not see it coming. So I'll let it hang there. But it, one thing that's kind of interesting, too, about watching it is it's very much like a it's staged like a play especially when they're in the room with the mirror. And she fi- so she figures out what's going on. Well, does what she needs to do to make it. <laughs> and I guess I will give away a little bit as f- because there's the mirror breaks at one point and the uh, person breaking it said, we had one mirror. If I didn't make this shot work, it was never going to work. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, wow. So, it's a spectacular f- mirror. It's a, Probably, and this is not a high budget film. I didn't find what the budget was, but just looking at it, you're going, This is not a high budget movie. The but it looks good. Holy shit. It's been fully remastered by a company called KL Studio, and you can get that on Blu-ray. Well, you can? How come yeah. I had such a hard time trying to find this? Or it was available on Blu-ray. Maybe I'll uh, double No, I no, it is still out because I put it on my buy later list so yeah you can still get okay. get it on blu-ray and it looks good some things went wrong i'm gonna since i such a short segment i've got some notes about it Yay. u.s distributors thought the movie was uh way too long so they removed the golfing story which is also pretty good uh the and the christmas ghost tale were also cut out the golfing story is where the guys go bet on a woman and whoever wins the golf match gets to marry the woman 
I so at I the wonder, I, I guess I haven't seen these segments. In the middle of it, this isn't the end. The middle of it, the guy walks. Maybe you saw the original U.S. cut. But after, after the guy loses the golf match, the guy that lost just walks into the lake and drowns himself. Oh, my gosh. And, but that's the middle, and it, the story goes from there. That one's pretty good, too. Nice. Hmm. But removing those kind of messes with the wraparound story, so it uh, confused the audiences a little bit, and it, it did all right. It did real, do real well on its release in the U.S., they even tried to shoo in some of those stories as a montage at the end of the film. Oh. Uh, the, the Lady Withers was interviewed. Uh, Australian TV in the 18, 1980s is where she talked about uh, the budget was fairly low for them, and she had that one mirror to break. But it was produced by a company called Ealing Studios out of the British. So oh, you've heard of them? I, I, that's where I went to film school. They're still around. Yep. They're still making movies. And this is, as far as I could tell, I read one place, this was the only horror film they ever did. And I could not find anything else that was horror that they did. Probably not. They were known for their comedies. That was mm-hmm. a big thing. The first film I ever worked on was an Ealing Studios <laughs> a reboot. Like when they, they were kind of becoming a studio again. They have participated now in more horror stuff, but usually by supplying a space where they can like build a set and do one shot. Or so like one as scene. a studio as opposed totally. to a producer. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. You don't get a lot of like Ealing um, productions anymore. Much more just like it's a space you can use. Yeah, so, that's cool. Yeah. So they've been around a while. <laughs> Very long time. Uh, they started, oh, they started in 1910 making films. So, <laughs> yeah, it's well. yep. And as far as this, the film itself, Scorsese placed Dead of Night on his list of the 11 scariest horror movies ever made. Wow. And it does have a good creep factor, especially for a film from that era. The writer-director Christopher Smith cites the circular narrative of the wraparound story for his inspiration in writing Triangle. Oh, interesting. <laughs> like, well, that's wild. But, uh, yeah, I can't recommend this film enough. The whole thing's great. This, the segment I mentioned is my favorite, but Ventriloquist is a, actually most people's favorite. That was the one that the recommendation of that is what led me to the watching the film. Ah, okay. If nothing else, get your library card and get Canopy. Or, you know, you can, I think it's only like a $20 disc, too, on Amazon. I'll, I'll, have, to, I'll have to look into this. I saw this film years and years and years ago. And I remember just loving it. Mm -hmm. And so with this thought in mind, I was like, I think I'm going to go and find that film and do the ventriloquist. And then I couldn't find it anywhere. And when you said you were doing this, I was like, (laughs) what? (laughs) So that just makes me happy that somebody is talking about it. Yeah. This is a a film that nobody talks about. No, it's deeply (laughs) underrated for what it is. It's sort of like when we first started talking about um, Val Luton. Oh, Mm. right, right. Where it's like, how is this guy so less regarded than universal this is this is one of those films it is it should be right up there with the universal movies yeah i agree to say that's awesome i've never heard of it and like i'm super stoked like i'm definitely gonna hunt this down yeah. find a reason a reason to get canopy that's right with a k by the with way with a k <laughs> okay writing that down okay so uh i'll go ahead and jump right in uh, I hope I'm, so. <laughs> it's my turn. <laughs> I'm taking it. Uh, you guys can't end without me talking about mine. Um, so I wasn't really sure what to choose because I actually haven't seen that many compilation sure. uh, anthology films. Like the one that I watched a lot as a kid was Cat's Eye, which you guys have discussed yeah. in length. Uh, not with me here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've seen a few others. I've seen like body bags and, you know, the different. Uh, creep show I think both of them sure. um, but uh, so there's plenty for me to choose from and so I just started asking people hey any thoughts and somebody said oh my gosh there's one on VHS 2 hmm. that you specifically will love and I was like that's a weird thing to say to another human <laughs> being Especially VHS 2. I have seen VHS. I was like, okay, sure. (laughs) So I sat down and I watched it and I was like, huh, well, this one's okay. Like, I guess maybe this is the one they're thinking. This one's all right. I mean, this one's kind of (laughs) cool. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, this one. (laughs) This one's pretty great. So um, the the section that I chose is something called Safe Haven. So what's the deal now? Just this woman thinks her son is missing. Doesn't look like anyone's home. Here, look at this. These tapes only affect you if you play it in a correct sequence.
Either of you guys seen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I've seen it. All right. So, um, yeah. So you you know, um, but there are some really interesting little things about this this segment, which I'm really excited to talk about. So, first of all, VHS two came out in 2013. Uh, it's 96 minutes long. I actually didn't write down how long my segment is, but I'm guessing it is probably at not least a long, fourth yeah. or less than that. Yeah. Probably. I don't know. Like. They they have some really short shorts on there, but that yeah. was one of the longer ones I think. It was a, it was a bit longer because they have a lot they fit in there. Um, critics uh, gave this seventy percent, audience fifty one percent for the whole VHS sure. two. Um, I could not find a budget, but they grossed eight hundred and five thousand. Um, 574, um, and they, in North America, they only got 21.8 K gross. So they, it did not do well. I thought VHS two, like actually was in theaters or something. No, it was more of a direct release. It was because the first one didn't do particularly well. I didn't realize this. I thought that they were huge. I obviously had my head in the wrong place. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So the the actual VHS two was put together by Collective Studios and also Bloody Disgusting, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, but this segment, it's the two names that are behind the directorial team, kind of give you an idea of why this is such a good thing. T- uh, Timo Timo Tajahanto. Sorry, I'm saying that horribly. <laughs> He's an Indonesian filmmaker. You guys might have seen The Night Comes for Us. Sure, okay. Yeah, yeah. so he directed that. Um, he also did some stuff for uh, May the Devil Take You, Killers, ABC of, of Death. He did a, a piece and something called a Headshot. Um, and then it was him and Gareth Hugh Evans who did The Raid, The Raid mm-hmm. 2. Yeah. Uh, who's from South Wales originally. Uh, so he, uh, just a really cool combination of people who are making fast-paced, frenetic, action-based pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, this particular film, it's it's interesting. It doesn't have a lot of um, named people. In fact, the only person who seemed to have been in something else really was this guy named Oka An- Antara, who plays kind of, I guess, the main guy, Malik. Not really. It, it, it's a, <laughs> it's like a bunch of people. It's like four people. And he was in Killers, The Raid 2. A lot of these people were actually in either The Raid or, or something that one of the directors had done. So they were like extras or smaller parts in one of those movies that they obviously were like, Hey, what, are you bored? Want to do this weird segment thing? <laughs> the plot of this is, um, a news crew composed of four people. We've got Malik. Who's the interviewer, uh, Lena, who's his girlfriend. And I think she's also an interviewer or producer. Um, and then Adam and Joni, who are the two cameramen, uh, they want to infiltrate this Indonesian cult in the hopes that they can make a documentary about this like really weird, mysterious um, thing that the, the cult is very secretive. They don't want a lot of people involved in it. And it starts off actually with them interviewing the cult leader in like a little cafe and being like, we would love to like enter your space. And like, I know you guys have gotten a lot of bad press. We want to show your side of things. And so the guy kind of reluctantly agrees that the cult leader, once they get inside to start setting up, um, you know, their interview, you start to see these really weird, bizarre things like these kids run up with these little uh, 
symbols made out of like sticks and twine and oh, they put yeah. one around the girl's neck and she's like oh thank you oh my god and like as soon as they turn takes it off it's like what the fuck <laughs> um there's a lot of like just weird eeriness to it there's school children in like a class and they're all kind of wearing this uniform it, it feels like very japanese or asian horror in that sense um a lot of women dressed in white and they all seem to be like part of something you're not quite sure they're sort of you don't know what they're doing you just know that it's weird and then there's a <laughs> bunch of men in suits in like a room that are all just standing in formation so you get the sense that okay it's a cult it's a weird cult situation <laughs> don't know what's what malik uh begins the interview um something happens he has to go get a battery so he leaves the room you get these really nice little comedy moments so like all of a sudden one of the cameramen has to like take over the interview and he has no idea what he's doing and he's like so um uh yeah so how are how are you like it just gets <laughs> really like weird in the meantime the cult leader you get the sense that something's about to go down he like cuts his stomach without them knowing like he, he does it right before they enter and he's like starts to bleed through his shirt you're like that's odd and it <laughs> feels like they're in this high preparation and you also discover that um malik actually overhears through one of the the comms that his girlfriend is pregnant with adam's baby <laughs> so there's drama and he's like you know really out of sorts about it so you know that one of them is pregnant and maybe that's possibly why she's there <laughs> anyway i won't give too much away other than i do have to say so at one point the cult leader um grabs his little radio and he's basically <laughs> saying the time of reckoning is upon us people start <laughs> committing suicide it has a really um fun twist ending that i'm, I'm definitely not going to spoil it's it's really neat. It's uh, I would say it's the raid meets a cult. <laughs> it's <laughs> very. It's got um, enough drama and kind of character development in such a short span of time that I felt like the stakes were actually pretty high. I actually cared about these people on any level whatsoever, which felt weird for an anthology nice. piece. The creepy cult feeling worked really well. I thought they definitely nailed it. Um, the plot overall was just crafted very nicely and the balance of humor to horror was really good. That being said, I really wish that I common, kind of almost wish it was a feature film. It had a lot of fun to Sounds it. Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. Like there's just so much going on that I really, I think it could have sustained a lot. However, you know, it's not a bad thing that it's a short. It's just that I wanted even more of it. The zombies were a bit, weird because I felt like there was so much going on already. I didn't know why there was also zombies happening, but that's okay. <laughs> and just a couple of small trivia notes that I, I managed to dig up on this. So Entertainment Weekly did an interview, a really badly done interview with the two directors <laughs> where they asked some really stupid questions. But beyond that, two a couple of interesting things. So the two directors were actually approached separately to each do a segment and uh Basically, Gareth Evans was like, um, hey, dude, I I got asked to do this thing. And like, do you want to do one with me? And the other guy was like, dude, I got asked to do a thing. <laughs> and I really want to learn about your style from the raid. Yo, bro, let's do it together. Because like everyone <laughs> lives in Indonesia. So that was pretty and cool. Yo, bro is a very big Indonesian saying. Sure. I will say, no, from the interview, like, Timo sounds like such a bro bro. <laughs> He's like, yeah. fucking hey, bro. Everything's crazy, <laughs> man. Like, they both, I didn't expect either of them to sound as bro -y as they do, but they do. Um, uh, it's based nice. actually off of the Jonestown Massacre. It was something that I think Timo had originally written that he wanted to do, like, a bigger piece on it. But um, this seemed like a, a great opportunity. They asked for a bunch of extras for this film who had no idea what the film was. So all these like Indonesian people showed up in like all these actors and like really nicely dressed with perfect haircuts and like ready to like look like model perfect for this film. So they basically just put them in a room and sprayed them down with blood. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and I was like, all right, you're ready to go. Uh, so that was really good. Um, they had a fight on set. Um, over whether or not a child 
would should be allowed to kill a, a grown adult and they had a big argument about it but in the end they decided not to and overall the reason why it got really crazy and frenetic near the end not only is because of this sort of style they both have of like fighting films and actiony stuff but they also got into this like one upmanship thing that was going on. <laughs> they're course. like what if this happened no way bro what if this <laughs> happens and they just started this weird interior like conflict of like no man this is fucking crazy you think that's crazy wait till i do this uh so <laughs> super fun i definitely enjoyed it um i can't say all of vhs2 was great the wraparound <laughs> i thought sucked balls well in this particular story doesn't fit with the wraparound none of them super do but this one yeah because yeah, this is an end of the world isn't oh that's true yeah. you're right yeah that i didn't even think about that um but would make it hard to discover the yeah. tapes later on exactly <laughs> yeah it, it would be weird if like unless it's some country that suddenly no one has heard of and or remembers in recent time <laughs> i didn't even think about that but yeah that's very true um there are a couple of other segments there's one with um a guy riding a bicycle through the woods with some zombies. Yeah. That one's super fun. The same same problem. Yeah, yeah, if the zombies rise. Yeah. Um, I, I don't like these films, but that's kind of the whole point of this. I mm -hmm. did like that segment yeah. in this yeah. film. And yeah. in the first VHS, uh, the first segment where the guys pick up the chick oh, and she right. turns out to be a vampire. Yeah. That right. That's yeah. a that's a cool segment. Yeah, it feels like just an excuse for some filmmakers to come together and put something, throw some spaghetti at the wall. Yeah, well, this you know, one of these days what we'll have to do is um, we'll have to sit down and maybe the topic will be uh, build a uh, a four a four movie anthology based on four segments right. from different films oh. that we really love and see if we come up with fun. like a perfect anthology. Ooh, nice. I like it. Whatever the wraparound story will be, will be. Right. <laughs> right. Well, that then uh, that's the show. That means Eric, you have to pick for uh, next week. Okay, last couple weeks ago, we yeah, talked about weeks. avoiding a particular topic because of what was going on in the world. Right. Eh, what the hell? Let's dive into it. Let's confront this face on. Sometimes that's some a good way to deal with what's going on around in the world. We're going to look at doing virus contagion kind of films, but not just end of the world segment necessarily they could be small things that cause people to to quarantine to quarantine themselves, themselves or to be quarantined to, right to get like into that. a small area to give it open it up a little bit from the you know seven or eight major really outbreak huge movies. outbreak films yeah. um yeah i think that if we uh if we kind of focus on the quarantined people as the since we're all kind of under lock and key right now, and yeah. how do yeah. other people deal we'll, with being we'll, quarantined? We'll pick them up now because, you know, in a few years, there's going to be a lot of them. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. We're all going to be dealing with our anxiety from this time through the medium of filmmaking. Right, and it is a fair bet that uh, this, this next episode will be our first remote Yep. Episode, we'll be so. from coming from quarantine. Yeah, <gasps> talking yeah. about so. I love it. Cheers, Matt. It makes sense. <laughs> okay, that's what we're talking about next week. As always, big huge thanks to everybody who's liking, sharing posts, uh, recommending to your friends. We have zero ad budget, so the only the only way that people are finding us is because you're telling them you like us, and the numbers are going up. So. Thank you so much to everybody. Big thanks again to Danny for uh, going above and beyond as yeah. usual. Yeah, but also to cool. Ron and Heather and all the other people who are always uh, championing the podcast. We really appreciate it. And we will see you next week. Our show is recorded somewhere high above Naval Station Everett at the nexus of all realities and is engineered and produced by Eric Morgret. Our theme music is Strange Eons Part 1 by the band Nightshade and is used with permission. Find Strange Eons Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and wherever fine podcasts are found.